The Bob Murphy Show, episode 167. There's a tidal wave coming. What you gonna do? Get ready for another episode of The Bob Murphy Show. The podcast promoting free markets, free minds, and grateful souls. It's your source for commentary and interviews, conducted by a Christian and economist. Now here's your host, Bob Murphy. Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of The Bob Murphy Show. Today I'm going to be talking with Dr. God Sad, who is the author of The Parasitic Mind, How Infectious Ideas Are Killing Common Sense. Now, uh, Dr. Sad is the runner of what's called the Sad Truth. You may have seen him. Uh, he's also been on various podcasts on Tom Woods show. He's been on Joe Rogan. It's all over the place. Very funny guy. Just so you know, though, in the beginning of our discussion, I deliberately focused on academic items because I wanted that side of his career or persona to shine through because he is such a fun-loving, funny guy that uh, I think in some of his other podcasts, some people might not realize that he's a serious academic as well. And so that's why I did focus on that element for some of his scholarly contributions before we get into the fun culture war stuff. For a more formal intro to who he is, here's from his bio. Dr. Gad Saad is professor of marketing, holder of the Concordia University Research Chair in Evolutionary Behavioral Sciences and Darwinian Consumption, an advisory fellow at the Center for Inquiry. He was an associate editor of Evolutionary Psychology and of Customer Needs and Solutions. He has held visiting associate professorships at Cornell University, Dartmouth College, and the University of California, Irvine. Dr. Sad was inducted into the who's who of Canadian business in 2002, and he was listed as one of the hot professors of Concordia University in both the 2001 and 2002 McLean's reports on Canadian universities. So without further ado, here is our discussion on his book, The Parasitic Mind. Well, Dr. Saad, welcome to The Bob Murphy Show. Thank you so much for having me, sir. Good to be with you. So uh, before we get into your latest book, The Parasitic Mind, of course, is the the main reason I wanted to talk to you. But since I'm a professional economist and I see, you know, when I was reading up on you that you apparently founded some new field that's the intersection of two areas. Can you just briefly explain what that is? Yeah, sure. Uh, So basically... Much of the work in consumer behavior has traditionally come from a non-biological perspective. So we look at maybe some of the psychological processes that drive consumption or economic processes or sociological or anthropological. What has always been missing in much of the social sciences in general and consumer behavior in particular is are there evolutionary mechanisms that can explain when we put on our hats as consumers why we behave the way that we do? How do our hormones affect our behaviors? Uh, would be one example. How does our physiology, how does our anatomy, how does our morphology? And so back in 1990, in my first year as a doctoral student at Cornell University, I had taken an advanced social psychology course by a gentleman uh, by the name of uh, uh, Dennis Regan. Mm-hmm. And about halfway through the semester, he had assigned a book called Homicide by two of the pioneers of evolutionary psychology, uh, Margot Wilson, uh, uh, Martin Daly and Margot Wilson, husband and wife team. And in the book, they looked at patterns of criminality around the world across time periods from an evolutionary lens. And that's where I had my epiphany because my goal was to study consumer decision making. By the way, I define consumption very broadly. It's not just consuming Coca-Cola and Starbucks. We consume friendships, we consume religious narratives, we consume experiences, everything is consumatory. Mm -hmm. And so that's where I I had the epiphany to take the evolutionary lens and apply it to then specifically the domain of consumer behavior, and hence the field that I founded was evolutionary consumption. But more generally, I've been been trying to, quote, Darwinize, if I can use a verb Mm -hmm. using Darwin's name, to Darwinize the business school in general. You You can't study manager behavior and employee behavior and trader behavior and consumer behavior, economic behavior, without ever invoking the biological mechanisms that drive all these behaviors. So that's the field that I worked in scientifically. So can I ask you, and I know maybe we can tie it to your your latest book, The Parasitic Mind, you've got a chapter in there on 
like the relationship between reason and emotion. Sure. So from a 50,000 foot view, economists are notorious for like imposing rationality and saying, and we know in practice people aren't rational, but this is a good first approximation. Yes. And also if you're going to try to model mistakes, you, you know, the sky's the limit. Whereas if you say, let's assume as a first pass, everyone does everything perfectly correctly. You know, that's, so that's where economists are coming from. And I don't know if you're familiar with like economists trying to study criminal behavior, like Gary Becker in particular, like they're very rationalistic about it. Like, right. oh, if I'm deciding whether to be a serial killer, mm -hmm. I look at the probability of being caught. And then it's, does this state have the death penalty? And da, 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 you know, so people, some people recoil against that and saying, you know, that's not how people are. And I'm wondering in, in your work, like, did you uncover certain things that would make sense from an evolutionary perspective, whereas from a, you know, rationalistic perspective, that it wouldn't make sense? Oh, sure. So, uh, great question. So, I, I was originally trained mm -hmm. within the paradigm of uh, Daniel Kahneman and Amos Tversky. Okay, sure. Yeah. And and there, and my, my former doctoral supervisor, the cognitive psychologist, J. Edward Russo, his first paper published ever was with Amos Tversky. Mm -hmm. uh, my professor at Cornell was also Dick Thaler, who just won the Nobel Prize in behavioral economics. Uh, and so I'm very well steeped within the tradition of pitting the classical economic view of decision making versus the what I call facetiously, but seriously, uh, the violation of the month club. And what do I mean by that? So Kahneman and Tversky and all the folks since mm -hmm. have done a wonderful job demonstrating that the view of homo economicus is incorrect. But my position has always been, and hence the evolutionary link, that, okay, we get it. This mythical unicorn that only exists in the deep recesses of an economist's mind, we don't behave the way that he does. Mm -hmm. But that would be like arguing that in a physiology program or an anatomy program, we're going to spend 40 years showing that our liver doesn't operate the way the mythical horse's liver operates like well mm -hmm. we know because the mythical horse doesn't exist and so our liver should not be akin to how the mythical horse is but usually the argument from the economist is about but yes but that's a nice normative way to set certain axiomatic boundaries mm -hmm. for how we ought to behave but that speaks by the way to an important uh, distinction between three types of decision making there is normative decision making, which is exactly what Gary Becker and all the rest of the classical rational choice theorists would do. Here are some norms. If I prefer car A to car B and car B to car C, I have to prefer car A to car C. If not, I am being intransitive in my choices. So that would be the normative approach. Uh, prescriptive approach would be something that I also studied uh, with my mathematics background. This is, for example, the field of operations research. Let's say I'm trying to optimize or minimize something. I, I, uh, there's something called the traveling salesman problem. If I am a salesman that needs to go to 10 cities, only going to each city once and returning to my starting point, how should I go about visiting those 10 cities as to minimize gas costs? Mm -hmm. Well, in this case, I have to use a prescriptive model. I'm trying to minimize something. So that's all normative decision making, prescriptive decision making. And the third class is the world that I inhabit in my career, which is descriptive decision making. I don't care about some norms in the minds of Gary Becker. I don't care about prescribing some optimal behavior. I just want to describe what people actually do. And what people do is they don't calculate the Gaussian distribution of crime patterns mm -hmm. and minimize it using some, right? That's bullshit, right? I mean, mm -hmm. it's nice, it's, nor it's normative, it's stylized, but it doesn't describe actual behavior. And so, uh, for example, our hormones, uh, uh, the average three-year-old knows that how I make a decision if I'm pissed off might be different than how I make a decision if my blood pressure is normal. Yet, how many studies have you seen in economics where visceral states, my lust, my hunger, my blood sugar, my anger, mm -hmm. you don't see these things. They are part of some plus delta in your econometric model. Right. So, so it's not that the normative guys are imbeciles. It's that they are pursuing a different goal. And by looking at all three different approaches, hopefully we have a better understanding of human decision making. For example, I've noticed that the more cups of coffee I have, the more annoying people are on Twitter. I don't know if you've noticed that. <laughs> <laughs> and what's interesting, well, like joking aside, that it, someone writing a tweet that bothers me would bother me even if I hadn't had any coffee. It's just the amount that I get mad at it 
varies with caffeine. Well, what you just said would mm -hmm. already be a big breakthrough in most economic journals because you mean coffee consumption might affect my behavior in such a way that I won't always arrive to the same behavior mm -hmm. independent of my physiological state. My God, what a breakthrough. Right. right? Let me, let, so let me give you one uh, example from about, I think it was 12 or 13 years ago, where, and it, it very much relates to, you know, economic decision making. So uh, some researchers, I think they were from Cambridge University, if I'm not mistaken, had looked at how uh, hormones affect uh, financial traders' behaviors. Right. Specifically, they looked at testosterone mm -hmm. and it turns out that because testosterone is a very good precursor, if you want, as a hormonal marker of risk taking. And this, of course, trading involves risk taking. So not surprisingly, they found some uh, links between testosterone of the traders and trading performance. Mm -hmm. But the second hormone that I thought was was a brilliant finding is they tracked the uh, traders cortisol levels, which is which is tracking your stress response mechanism, and they linked it to the volatility of the market. Because what is most stressful is me not being able to predict with statistical regularity mm -hmm. how the market is moving. And if you if you put the two curves together, it looks very nice. Well, to me, I look at that and I go, yeah, no kidding, right? right? right. But to, within an economic perspective, the hyper-rational calculational robot, my God, what a breakthrough. Hormones affect behavior, who knew? You see, and so this is really what I've been doing in my scientific career, trying to marry evolutionary biology and evolutionary psychology mm -hmm. within behavioral sciences. Okay, well, that's that's great. And I guess if we were if we were talking about your other book, then I would just keep pursuing that. But we're talking about the parasitic mind. So I, I want to get into the, you know, some of the details of it, obviously, but for the benefit sure. of the listener who doesn't know what it is, hasn't seen you on previous interviews, and, and you've been on some big shows with Rogan and so forth. Just, you know, what does the title mean? Why did you call it that? What's, what's the subject matter? Yeah, so basically, if you look at uh, the field of neuroparasitology, neuroparasitol so parasitology is the study of how parasites can, uh, well, parasitize various hosts. So a tapeworm can parasitize your uh, intestine, right? Mm -hmm. Neuroparasitology is the field that looks at parasites that look to go to a host's brain, rewiring its behavior in the pursuit of its interest, of its reproductive interest. And so as an evolutionary psychologist, one of the tools that we use is to look at what's called comparative psychology, to look at other species behaviors and then link it to human behavior. And I'm giving you this big story to exactly answer mm -hmm. where parasitic mind comes from, where idea pathogens come from. And so over the past, you know, since, since I became a professor, I've noticed, seen, documented the consistent war on reason, science, logic, common sense that has been taking place within the university hallways. Mm -hmm. And so many of these ideas struck me as truly dreadful ideas because it takes intellectuals to come up with really dumb ideas. Yep. And so... I, I wanted to find a framework to try to understand what could cause people to find such dreadful ideas so intoxicating and alluring. How, how could you succumb to such, forgive the term, bullshit? And so that's where then the neuroparasitological framework came to, to, to my mind. Because So let me just give you one or two examples so that we can put it in tangible terms for your audience. So the classic example of a, of a brain parasite would be Toxoplasma gondii which is a parasite that actually can infect human brains. But the classic example is when it infects the brain of a mouse, mm -hmm. the mouse loses its innate fear of cats and it actually becomes sexually attracted to the cat, to the smell of the cat's urine, which is not a very good preference to it's hold not very for adaptive. a mouse. Yeah. <laughs> it's not very adaptive. And another example would be another brain parasite that affects the brains of ungulates, moose, elk, deer, so that if they are parasitized by this brain worm, they start engaging in circling behavior where they kind of go around in a circle, unable to extricate themselves from this motor pattern. And even if the looming predators are coming, they can't instantiate the adaptive mm -hmm. mechanism of fleeing. And so that was my aha. So now, so now I'm going to use that framework to argue that in the same way that humans and other animals can be parasitized by literal brain worms. We regrettably can be parasitized by another class of brain worms, which I called idea 
pathogens. Because remember, a pathogen could be a virus, could be a bacterium, could be a fungus, or could be a parasite. And so the, so the term idea pathogen makes it more broad. Mm -hmm. And of course, it can spread in, in the way that memes, for example, can spread. Right. Uh, and so that's where the parasitic mind, how infectious ideas are killing common sense comes from. Does that give you a good sense? Yes, definitely. Yeah. So, and just so you know, I know you don't know me that well, but at all, in fact, but so I'm totally on board with what you're doing. So I'm just pushing you here as devil's advocate. Um, of course. Thank you. So I, I'm concerned, quick story. I was in grad school. I went to NYU for economics. You have a PhD in economics. Maybe your, your, your listeners must know, but let me plug you, right? Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and my buddy was, you know, was a masochist or something. And, he, and there was a, a meeting of like the, the com, I think there was like literally the communist or something. And he, he had to go, we got to go to this, this, this meeting, Bob. And we were in there and it was um, mostly w w women, you know, people of color were in there and they were talking. And so then it came time to the Q and A and I raised my hand and I, they were talking about how, how much equality there had been in the Soviet union and what between the sexes and wasn't that great. And I, right. and I said, and I, I was not being sarcastic. I was genuinely asking, I said, yeah, um, are you guys saying though that like the average woman was better in the Soviet Union than like in the United States at that time? Or, and the, the look the, the moderator gave me, she just like turned her head and looked at me like I was a mental patient. Like, oh, you're thinking of things like that, you right, know? Right. And you're using logic and data right. to make a point. And yeah. so I, I, I resented that, that they weren't grappling with the ideas. They were just classifying me as insane. So I'm wondering my only concern is, are we doing this? Like, because in your book, you like talk about lunacy and da, 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 da. And I do agree yeah. with you. So again, I'm, this is more, I'm just like saying, yeah. hey, do we need to step back? And are, are we doing the same thing to the left is, is what I'm getting at. Like, are we just saying, it's not just your ideas are bad. You guys are parasites. You're, you're viruses. Do right. you see what I'm saying? Right. Well, I'm not, I'm not saying that the people are parasites. That's true. Okay. I, I'm saying that their brains have right, been right, parasitized. Right, right leading them to the abyss of infinite lunacy. Okay. And again, here, the reason I'm using that metaphor is because mm -hmm. in the same way that the mouse is finding the cat's urine so intoxicating, mm -hmm. by the same token, you know, I am quietly being led astray to the abyss of infinite lunacy. Shh, be quiet, it'll all work out, right? Mm -hmm. it, here, I use another example from the animal literature. So there is a class of parasitic wasps that are really straight out of a science fiction movie. So a parasitic wasp, uh, specifically a, a, a spider parasitic wasp, will find a much larger spider, it will sting it, rendering it zombified, and then it, it, it pushes it, drags it to its burrow, where it then lays an egg, and as the egg hatches, it eats the para the the spider uh, spider in vivo. Well, I argue, for example, that political correctness is a grand civilizational parasitic wasp sting, right? Mm -hmm. Because it it lulls me into silence, into the burrow of infinite lunacy, right? So all of these examples that I come up with are you know very very carefully chosen mm -hmm. because you see the corollary in uh, elsewhere in nature, right? So. Again, just to be clear, so it's you're not simply grasping and saying, you know what, I really dislike these ideas. They're crazy. They're like you. You mean the the analogy to be much like it really is analogous. You're saying. Oh, it is, and mm. and be, because because then if you you know in, in my book I talk about in chapter seven how to seek truth, mm -hmm. and I offer an a very powerful epistemological tool to explain how you seek truth. So it's not as though I'm saying. Whatever I believe is true, Bob, and if you don't believe what I believe, you're a quack and a nut. Mm -hmm. uh, I always use the, the you know, the, the framework of the scientific method in general, but specifically an epistemological tool that I call nomological networks of cumulative evidence to drown you in evidence, right? So it's so nothing that I do is based on, you know, I'm better than you, you're dumb, you're quack, as the lady did with you. She was pathologizing you, which often happens in totalitarian uh, regimes, right? Mm -hmm. Anybody who doesn't believe in communism needs to be sent to Gulag 13 for re-education because they must be insane. Obviously, that's not what I'm saying. What I am saying, though, for example, is we can adjudicate between competing ideas in deciding, for example, whether a six foot seven, 280 pound, 85 pound guy full of muscles who tomorrow self-identifies, 
appropriately. Maybe he does think he's a woman. That's mm-hmm. that's perfectly fine. Whether it makes scientific sense to argue that he should compete with biological females because there are no anatomical, morphological, physiological, biological, behavioral differences between him and biological women. I am able to offer scientific evidence that suggests that you must be insane to argue for such a position. Right, right. Okay, good. Um, So uh, let me ask you this. So there's a there's a principle, I guess, right, that generally speaking, the parasite shouldn't be fatal to the host because that doesn't serve the parasite's interest. Right. But obviously, there must be all kinds of qualifications there, like the sure. the, the, spider, the wasp and the spider one. Obviously, that kills. Yeah. The, but so, uh, what, why well, is where, this happening? Why, where does the idea of pathogen come from? That too, but also, like, would we expect them to back off? And again, I realize it's not that the individual genes know what's going on. So, but anyway, you you get the idea, like, because right now it looks like we're on a crash course for de- destruction yeah. of Western civilization if yeah. these ideas keep grabbing hold of more institutions. So, would you so expect it to, to pull back because that doesn't that's not good for anybody, not even the Marxists? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> good question. So, I I think that the the brilliance of the these, I, you know, parasites, these idea parasites is that they share a few things in common. And, you know, I'm someone who is very much of a synthetic thinker. I need to synthesize things. I need Mm -hmm. to create consilience, which is a term that was reintroduced into the lexicon by E.O. Wilson, the Harvard uh, evolutionary biologist, when he wrote a book in the late 1990s called Consilience. Consilience refers to unity of knowledge. So physics is more consilient than sociology. Not because sociologists are dumb and not scientific and physicists are smart and scientific, but it's because physics operates under a certain set of organized tree of knowledge. Sociology doesn't. It's haphazard. That's one of the problems I argue in the social sciences, which, by the way, is why I seek to introduce evolutionary theory wherever I can within the behavioral sciences, because it is the only framework that can unify the behavioral sciences. But Can can I stop you for a second? I want to make sure I understand this principle. Are you saying that because physicists, given that they're saying the the thing we're dealing with in this field is like the material universe and energy, they're giving, they explain everything if they had the right thing, whereas a sociologist doesn't pretend that, oh, no, this theory that's explains, not that's not what it is. Okay. What no, is that's it not what I'm saying. Okay. What I'm saying basically is, okay, let's, let's go to chemistry. Mm-hmm. There are no chemists who are for the periodic table and chemists who are against the periodic table. Mm-hmm. So there's already a start, an epistemological starting point where we all agree that there is such a thing as a periodic table, and we all agree that there are those elements. There is no bifurcation in terms of pro-periodic table and anti-periodic table, right? Mm-hmm. That allows us to have greater consilience within the field because at least there are certain core knowledge that we all agree on. Now, that doesn't mean that that's a revealed truth and it's done. If in 300 years we uh, new information comes in, then we will revise, right? Mm-hmm. Science is provisional truths. But we all agree that there is a periodic table. We all agree that there are four forces in physics. In sociology, we don't agree if human beings start off with biological imperatives in their brain or not. So already from the first starting point, Mm -hmm. we have two trees of knowledge that are going to have no linkage. You follow? Yep, yep, yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so, so the way my brain, my brain thinks is it's, it always looks for consilience, for creating connections so that I can have a broad explanation very quickly of one. That's why I love evolutionary theory, by the way, because it is so elegant and parsimonious in what it can explain. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now let's link this to the the original question you asked. So as I was, you know, identifying each of those idea pathogens in the book and postmodernism, militant feminism, social constructivism, biophobia, cultural relativism, and many others that I discussed in the book, identity politics, all of these idea pathogens have a couple of things in common. So this is where the synthetic part comes in. Because mm-hmm. I want to be able to say, is there any regularity to all those idea pathogens? Just like, for example, in cancer, the cancers are very different. Pancreatic cancer is different than leukemia. But at least what we know for sure is that there is the unchecked 
cell division that happens in all cancers. At least we know that's one commonality right, right. for all cancers. Well, so what do all these idea pathogens have in common in my view? Well, first, they all have a assiduous attempt to free us from this pesky thing called reality. And so I talk about idea pathogens being a form of freedom from reality. Mm -hmm. Now, why would you want to free yourself from reality? Because oftentimes it is, it is, it's feel good to free yourself from certain forms of reality. So you start off with a kernel of truth with each of these idea pathogens and with some laudable social goal, but then it metamorphosizes into insane idea pathogen. So right. for example, if you take equity feminism, it's a great idea. Equity feminism says that men and women should be equal under the law. There should be no institutional mechanisms or forces that create disparity, institutional disparity between men and women. Well, most people today would say, yeah, yeah, sign me up for that. I'm an equity feminist. In the pursuit of that laudable objective, we shouldn't murder truth. We shouldn't then go on to militant feminism, which says, that there are no important biological differences between men and women. Evolution doesn't explain evolved sex differences. Everything is due to a social construction. So in the pursuit of the original laudable goal, we end up murdering truth. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yes. So, so all of these idea pathogens, the reason why they are intoxicating and so alluring, and so why so many people could be willfully parasitized by them, is because if you don't have the correct mental hygiene discipline to protect yourself against this bullshit, it's easy to fall prey to it because it, it has a feel good platitude to it. Mm -hmm. So, right. And I mean, it, it is true. Like even like, what do we tell little kids? Like, hey, you can be anything you want when you grow up. And in a certain sense, that's a good thing to tell them. Don't let people tell you what you can and can't do. But you're right. It, does that mean then that, you know, oh, so if I'm a six, five guy that I can go ahead and, you know, be in a female MMA fighter, like, you know, Joe Rogan's type of example. Right. Um, and so, so it is interesting. I was like, well, no, that's not what we meant when we said you can be anything you want. <laughs> so well, and by the way, mm -hmm. John, John Watson, one of the founders of behaviorism, so stimulus response model mm -hmm. psychology, he has a very famous quote, which I, I quote in the book where I'm, I'm going to botch the exact quote, but it's something like, give me 12 infants and I could turn any one of them into a beggar, a surgeon, uh, whatever. Right. No, you can't. Right. No. We, we are not born with equal potentiality. We are not born with the equal starting point. I did not have an equal chance of becoming an NBA all-star like Michael Jordan did. He did start off on a better footing than me. Now, that's not a very nice message. I would much prefer a message that says, Mordechai Rubenstein, the five foot four uh, Jewish de deli flipper, mm -hmm. has just as good of a chance as Michael Jordan to be the next NBA star. That feels good. If I'm Mordechai's parent, I wanna believe that but it's also bullshit. It mm -hmm. also frees me from the shackles of reality, hence idea pathogenic. Yeah, so let me though, just go back again to, um, is, is there any reason we would suppose that these ideas that are seeming like they're head driving us over a cliff would, would pull back because, again, in the, in the same way that a parasite shouldn't kill the host and you know, you'd think over evolution, like you know, viruses yeah. don't get as lethal and stuff because it's, it's better to just you know, take over the, the host and let them, uh, transmit it to other people before, you know, you don't want to kill them too fast, in other words. Right. Uh, I, I think the only way you can defeat those bad ideas is with better ideas. There's a field, mm -hmm. to go back to evolutionary theory, there's a field called evolutionary epistemology. Evolutionary epistemology basically models knowledge mm -hmm. as a form of selection, right? Mm -hmm. Ideas are selected or they lose out just like we have selection in, in the actual biological world. Mm -hmm. And so that field is called evolutionary epistemology. Uh, Dean Simonton, a psychologist who studies creativity, has done something similar, arguing that creativity is a form of Darwinian selection. So how do creative ideas come about? How are they spawned? And so to answer your question in hopefully not too long-winded a way, th there is no way to defeat those ideas other than by pitting them against better ideas. So when I talk later in the book about, you know, a you know, global vaccine against these bad ideas, I'm being literal, right? Mm -hmm. And by the way, I get tons of people who write to me and say, well, you know, I used to be one of those people who bought into postmodernism and the, the rest of the nonsense. And then I read your stuff and watch your lectures and so on. And now I can't believe that I believe this bullshit, right? Mm -hmm. So 
it's a it's a it's it's trench warfare. It's a it's a long game. You you're not going to you know uh, institute the vaccine overnight and everybody's going to be done. But it requires a certain commitment from people to be able to get involved in the battle of ideas. So in in chapter eight, for example, I talk about activating your inner honey badger. And here, what I'm referring to, the honey badger is an incredibly ferocious animal Mm -hmm. that can withstand the approach of, you know, six adult lions, even though it is the size of a small dog. Well, activate your epistemological honey badger. If you come after me on Twitter, if you follow me on Twitter, you better really, as I say, come correct because I'm coming after you 10 times harder, right? Mm -hmm. So why? Because if I think I know something and I can defend it, if I have built the correct nomological network of cumulative evidence that suggests that my position is scientifically unassailable, I'm coming after you and I'm going to drown you in evidence. So, but that takes effort, right? Mm -hmm. And by the way, that speaks to the earlier topic in chapter two, where I talk about thinking versus feeling, Mm -hmm. right? Our emotional system is a fast and frugal process, right? It's much easier for me to say, I hate Donald Trump. He disgusts me. He's vile. He's vulgar. It doesn't take much for me to instantiate that response. It takes a lot more effort for me to actually listen to his policies, weigh the pros and cons. My emotional system is much easier to deploy. Mm -hmm. And, And so in that chapter, I talk about, you know, be careful. There are very clear cases where triggering your emotional system makes perfect adaptive sense. When I'm going down a dark alley to take a shortcut home and I see four young men loitering and my heart starts racing, that makes perfect adaptive sense. If I'm trying to solve a calculus problem, triggering my emotional system won't help me solve the calculus problem. So, you know, triggering the right system at the right time is the challenge. Right. And I'm I'm glad you brought that up. And I did want to circle back to that because that's, um, I don't know if you're familiar with Gavin DeBecker. His book was The Gift of Fear. Um, so, sure. okay. okay so. so he's, I think what his day job is, is, or at least used to be that he, he was like a security consultant for like, you know, movie stars and stuff, you know, like to come in okay. to make sure that, that, you know, some you know, stalker can't get into my, my place and whatever. And some guy keeps leaving me phone messages. What do I do? That kind of stuff. But so he wrote a book called the gift of fear. And that's, as you can guess from the title, that's what he's saying. Like, if your gut's telling you something, don't ignore it. You know what I mean? Right. Like if, if the handyman who comes to the house and you're, you know, a single woman, gives you the creeps, don't bring him back, you know, don't right, ignore right. that stuff, that kind of stuff. And so, um, so that's what I like that you, you know, cause like the Ben Shapiro, like, you know, facts don't care about your feelings or whatever. There yeah. is this tendency on the right yeah. to sort of say, we are Mr. Spock and don't you be some whiny, you know, woman who needs a swooning couch. And yet, exactly. but what you're saying though, no, I mean, your emotion, there's a reason Exactly. That you have emotions. And, so can you just talk a little actually, bit more about that? Yeah. Yeah. So, and I, I, I specifically introduce a term. Uh, I think the first time that I published it, what might have been in a 2005 book chapter I wrote in uh, the Handbook of Evolutionary Psychology, and the term is epistemological dichotomania, which basically refers to this incessant desire for humans to create worldviews that are based on two factors that are pitted against each other. It's emotions or it's thinking. Mm -hmm. I'm a feeling animal or I'm a thinking animal. No, you're both, right? Mm -hmm. So when, as a matter of fact, within evolutionary psychology, there's a whole field that studies the evolutionary roots of emotions, Mm -hmm. right? So romantic jealousy, uh, schadenfreude, when I rejoice at the mishaps of others, uh, envy, uh, fear, anger, pride, shame, Mm -hmm. all of these emotions don't exist out of magic. They didn't come out of nowhere. So our emotional affective system is itself an adaptive system that has served our ancestors well. So the idea that, you know, it's one or the other is simply false. Mm -hmm. What happens though, and that's really, you know, the ultimately the key takeaway of that chapter is when you are deploying the wrong system at the wrong time, it's a mismatch problem, right? Mm -hmm. So when I am simply relying on how cool and suave Obama looks in saying that I want him to be president, this is where I take my Arabic background and I bring in uh, sayings from Arabic and a classic one that now has become famous all over the internet perhaps because Greg Gutfeld doesn't stop saying it all over the place on Fox because he he heard me Mm -hmm. in art. So here I'm going to pretend that this is a cork Mm -hmm. of a wine bottle, okay? So there's an expression in Arabic that's, which obviously when translated in English says, 
getting drunk by simply smelling the cork of the wine bottle. What does that mean, right? It means that I don't need to actually go through the effort of drinking the wine to get drunk. I'm such a lightweight that simply drink, simply smelling the cork, I'm mm -hmm. already drunk and intoxicated. So when I look at Obama and I go, my God, he is so cool with that radiant smile. Or when I look mm -hmm. at Trump and I go, what a vulgar ogre, he's mm -hmm. disgusting. I'm a moron. I'm an imbecile. I'm letting the cork decide my mm -hmm. position. No, the reality is I know many highfalutin, super intellectual imbeciles in my world that are perfectly rational when it comes to everything other than Trump. But by the way, this is not a diatribe on I love Trump, but I'm, mm -hmm. I'm using that example right, right. or of the election. So it's very relevant to talk about, you know, relevant examples. If you ask them, hey, what's your position on immigration? they are much more likely to be closer to Trump. What's your position on freedom of speech? Trump. What's your position on critical race theory and all that nonsense? Trump. But he disgusts me. Right. So all of my cognitive justification went out the window. He's not presidential. But Obama says Pakistan with that accent. He's cool, he's worldly. Yeah. <laughs> Some of us speak four languages fluently. We're not cool. But he says Pakistan coolly. So he is, he's just suave. He's got it together. Mm -hmm. He hangs out with Jay-Z. That's the kind of idiocy you see amongst my highfalutin friends. Yeah, yeah. On that issue of like looking at the policies and whatever, I remember a great example of this was there would, I don't know, this would have been on your radar up there, but there was a Miss America contestant and she was doing well. And then what knocked her out though at some point was they asked, what's your opinion on, I don't know, I think they probably said same sex marriage. And you could tell she didn't want to answer because she knew it was going to disqualify her. But she said, well, I'm I'm Christian. And so I believe, you know, I was raised that the Bible said marriage is between a man and a woman. Boom, she was done. She didn't make <laughs> it. And then so later, of course, you know, she was doing the rounds on Fox and whatever. And they were pointing out her position was exactly what like Hillary Clinton had said two years before that or something. Or yeah, Obama. Yeah, and Obama too. <laughs> Yeah. And you, exactly. but I was like, no, because now they finally moved a bit and, and now you can no longer say that. So it was hilarious that she was saying something literally that Obama had said a few years earlier, but no, that was enough to disqualify her. Um, exactly. Okay, so I want to ask you something. So in your book on chapter four, so the title of the chapter is Anti-Science, Anti-Reason and Illiberal Movements. And you have this quote from Voltaire that I don't think I'd ever heard this one before that says, those who can make you believe absurdities can make you commit atrocities. So by you putting that quote there, are you showing that there is a method to the madness here, that at least the people organizing these movements, you know, as opposed maybe to the foot soldiers are, in other words, like, do you think that at some level, if you go up high enough in the chain, those people know full well that there are, you know, that a man and a woman are different things and they're just doing this right. to try to get obedience? So I don't think there's sort of a cabal that is, promulgating each of the idea pathogens that mm -hmm. I discuss in the book. I think it, it comes, if you like, from a loosely organized set of bullshitters called professors mm -hmm. in academia over the last 40, 50 years that seek to be arbiters of what an ideal society should be. So they're utopian. And, and, and being utopian, you have to get rid of the current. So right, so down, down capitalism. If only we instituted true socialism, right? The, the 150 other cases where socialism has failed has been falsely implemented. But if tomorrow we institute true socialism, as my intellectual hero, Occasional Cortex uh, says, this is the, you know who Occasional Cortex is because you don't, you don't seem to be following. No. <laughs> uh, okay, is AOC. Oh, 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 okay. <laughs> okay, so I call her Occasional Cortex. So, uh, <laughs> occasion, yeah, now you're, oh, now he's getting, yeah, yeah, now he's yeah. catching up, he's catching up to the joke. So Occasional Cortex is, is saying, right, I mean, no, no, socialism will work, but, you know, only if, mm. if I institute it, right? I mean, mm. what, when, when I come, right, Islam says the same thing. I mean, sure, it hasn't worked for 1400 years, but in a true pure Islamic state, I mean, let the freedom reign. This is where you have beautiful freedom, for especially for women, for gays, and especially for Jews. Jews really run free, uh, or rather run really fast in an Islamic uh, society. So, so I think a lot of these idea pathogens are not, there is no conspiratorial sort of grand plan, mm -hmm. but they each have a, false understanding of human nature 
but they think that they are galloping on a moral high horse and therefore they promulgate these idiotic ideas. Okay. Um, and, and so you do, you do think it, even if you went all the way up to the top that these, that they genuinely believe what they're saying? So it depends. Uh, mm -hmm. It depends on which pathogen. This is where, remember earlier I was giving the cancer analogy and I said there are some commonalities across sure, all yeah. cancers, but then the cancers are different. Mm -hmm. So let me give you uh, cultural relativism, right? So cultural mm -hmm. relativism is the idea of, you know, who are we to judge the the behaviors and the beliefs and the practices of other cultures? That's racist. That's, that's cultural imperialism. So if a society wants to cut off the clitorises of five-year-old girls, who are you to judge, you white bigot, mm -hmm. right? OK, so where did that come from originally? Cultural relativism is a movement that was originally founded by the anthropologist Franz Boas, who knew that biology placed in the wrong hands could cause problems. So why, for example, is evolutionary theory so despised? So example, British class elitist said, hey, there's a Darwinian struggle between the classes. We're the upper class, you're the lower, lower class. And so if you die out, who cares? That's Darwinian. Of course, it has nothing to do with Darwinian theory, right. but they are usurping evolutionary theory to, to pursue their nefarious positions. Uh, Nazis said, hey, there's a class between the races. We're the Aryans, you're the Jews, you lose. So what's wrong if we get that? That's Darwinian. Darwin said this. Right. Darwin never said such a thing. Eugenicists said, hey, uh, we want to sterilize uh, certain undesirables from the population so that they don't reproduce and extend their genes. Hey, that's Darwinian. What's wrong with that, right? So Franz Boas and then his subsequent students wanted to create a new understanding of human nature where biology is not relevant, right? So in the pursuit, so we go back to my earlier point, in the pursuit of that noble goal, mm -hmm. you end up murdering truth, mm -hmm. right? You end up the reality is there are human universals. The reality mm -hmm. is there are biological forces that unite us under a common evolutionary heritage. But he rejected that. He argued there are there is not a single human universal. As a matter of fact, his most famous student, Margaret Mead, I don't know if you know you've heard of her. The I, I have heard of her, yeah, but yeah, I don't know much about her. She basically argued mm -hmm. that. Well, there is some Samoan tribe in some uh, you know uh, exotic place where even sex behavior, you know, mating behavior is reversed. Men are all chaste and virginal and women run after them. That society didn't exist. It was her bullshit. She wanted to see that. They mm -hmm. were they were hoaxing her, right? Mm -hmm. So she was so desperate to believe in this false narrative that her science objectivity ultimately failed. So the whole story that I just told you is simply the evolution of one idea pathogen, cultural mm -hmm. relativism. Each of the different idea pathogens has a different g genesis story. So, so that's why I'm, I'm hesitant to say there is kind of one cabal of conspiratorial guy. Now, your question of whether they deep inside the recesses of their minds, whether they believe it or not, I think it depends. So, for example, postmodernists, I think in the deep recesses of their mind, absolutely know that they are intellectual terrorists and frauds. And I've actually argued. Uh, for the following theory. So the, the top three postmodernists are, they're all three French postmodernists, mm -hmm. uh, Michel Foucault, Jacques Lacan, and Jacques Derrida, sort of the holy trinity of French bullshitters. And those three guys, in my view, he, he, so here's my theory, and mm -hmm. I, I don't have proof for it, but I, I think there is some compelling evidence that suggests that I'm on the right track. I don't, I'm speaking now as them. I don't like walking around and all those physicists on the other side of campus are getting all the glory or all those neuroscientists. Mm -hmm. We are also important. But in order for us to be important, we need to create a language that is as impenetrable as that of the mathematicians. Mm -hmm. Think about a typical mathematics paper. By line one, you're gone. You're right, out. Because right. you don't. You can't even read the first line, right? right? You're out. In other words, it takes a holy cast of priests called mathematicians to decipher that. Well, I, as a postmodernist, now speaking as one of those right, bullshitters, right. I want to create a similar verbiage so that when I write papers, they are as impenetrable. And if you look at their work, it is as impenetrable as reading a math paper. The reality is spoken communication should not be that impenetrable. Mm -hmm. Therefore, what I argue is they created this faux profundity, which I discuss in the parasitic mind, as a way to create sort of an austere 
fake profundity to what they're saying. As a matter of fact, Michel Foucault, in an interview with John Searle, the famous American philosopher, John Searle was saying to him, how come when I speak to you, it seems like you make sense, but when I read your stuff, I don't know what the hell you're talking about. He goes, oh, well, that's because in France, if you don't kind of confuse people, then they won't take you seriously. Aha, my mm -hmm. theory is mm -hmm. validated. Right, right. So I think that in some cases, in the deep recesses of their mind, they know they're full of shit. Right. Okay. Well, so let me just try one time more on this to see if you get what I'm where I'm coming from. Sure. So I agree with everything you just said, but still, and, and here's where, let me give you two examples. So again, my concern is that at some level, these people, like they have these frameworks that may have been sincerely developed, but certain people realize, oh, they're like at a buffet and they're going to grab them and use them to achieve political ends. And so my evidence is that they don't apply it consistently. So the one, you know, so, so uh, one example would be that, you know, you, you can be anything you want, you know, you can identify as whatever, but at least in the United States, someone who's not black cannot just announce, you know what, I'm a black person as we've seen, like you're not allowed to do that, right. right? And so that seems to be a contradiction within the thing. And I've heard people try to explain why, but still, you know, if prima facie, no, you can be whatever you want, including, you know, I, you and I could both be star basketball, but you can't do that. Right. And then what, the, what you just mentioned, I noticed, um, so Foucault and Derrida signed, I don't know if the other one did it on this, but there was some petition to, um, in France to get rid of the age of consent laws because there was like some famous, person intellectual who had been like cavorting with I think like 14 year old girls or something and who was being brought up on charges and so there was a big petition to get rid of these laws and the, I think the the spirit of at least why those two two signed it was along the lines of you know oh you know who are we to judge between this relationship between these two people you know it's arbitrary for us to say whether it's consensual you know who who can who can say that kind of stuff but yet they didn't sign a petition to get rid of minimum wage laws in France. Like, who are we to say right. whether the employer... So do you see what right. I'm saying, that they yeah, use it very selectively? Well, well, and cognitive consistency is not a hallmark of belief systems that mm -hmm. are complete departures from truth. That's why eventually they crack. That's why mm -hmm. they are fissures in their edifices of bullshit, right? Mm -hmm. So you're exactly right. As a matter of fact, I talk about if you are three years old, and you declare yourself to be transgender, then Char Charlize Theron comes out and announces to 25 million people that her three-year-old is whatever, transgender. So not only we could talk about whether it makes sense for a three-year-old to be making that pronouncement, right. but, but I also think it's quite creepy for you to be announcing that very private thing of a three-year-old right, right. to 25 million people. That's a separate issue. But... So from this side of the mouth, a three-year-old is sufficiently ready to proclaim their transgender status from this side of the mouth. Mm -hmm. From that side of the mouth, if you are 17 years old, 364 days old, so you're one day shy of being 18, and you commit a heinous mur murder, the same progressives will come out in defense of this child, this child who's prefrontal cortex mm -hmm. is still not yet fully developed. How could he have known between right and wrong when he murdered his parents and his, his, his sister so that he can take the insurance money? He's just a child. Right. So the 17 year old 364 day guy was too mm -hmm. young to be able to recognize that that was a wrong act. The three year old is ready to transition into his new gender identity. That's what idea packages right, right. do to you. And I guess, I don't know if this is, if you would agree, maybe another example of that phenomenon is how in the United States, there were a couple of prominent examples of where a, a, a famous black person expresses support for Trump and is told in no uncertain terms, both by black and white people, no, if you have black skin, you have to be for Biden. What are you talking about? And yet, <laughs> well, whoa. It's <laughs> even more than that. Uh, Joe Biden has come up with a new form of genetics and what that allows you to identify if you are black or white as a function of whom you vote for. Mm -hmm. So if you are black, if you are Herschel Walker, the famous football player who's a black man, and you vote for Trump, you are no longer black, right? Mm -hmm. Remember the old, you ain't black if mm -hmm. you don't vote for me? It, I mean, it's insane. I mean, imagine how insulting that is. I mean, I, by the way, last week I was interviewed on a show by this gentleman called Bishop 
uh, Larry Gators, who's a black man, who's a bishop, you know, like a theologian, mm -hmm. and he's a black conservative. And we were exactly talking about this point. I was saying, think about if there's anything more racist than removing personal agency right. and personal autonomy from an individual. You, Herschel Walker, you, Larry Elders, you, Candace Owen, you don't have personal autonomy. You're black. Your skin is of a certain you. Therefore, you vote this way. Got it? I mean, what could be more racist? Right. Yet that message is promulgated by the progressive camp. I mean, it's insane. Right. The people who like slogans like free your mind and stuff like that. So it is amazing. Okay, let me, for sure, I want to make sure I get this in because I saw you explain this in somebody else's podcast and that was the thing. So I got to get this guy on, on my show. You have a theory for why is it that like among Antifa, there's a lot of people who are not like big muscles and prototypically yes. male and you linked it to a, like an evolutionary. So can you talk a bit about that? Sure. So in the exact same way that when we started our conversation, you said, where, you know, where does the parasitic mind mm. come from? The idea, of, and I, I drew you the analogy with neuroparasitology and so on. The beauty of being steeped in an understanding of many species is that that allows you to create these links, as I will in answering the next question. So your question, just to, to restate it is, you know, it, it, is there a way to uh, explain the the morphological realities of some of these uh, male Antifa types, right? And so here, what I argued is, that, so there's a zoological term. It's, it's not me who introduced it. It, it, it. My theory is linking that term to male social justice warriors. Right. Okay? The term is, and I'm, can I say the term or on your show? Well, we, we're, we're going to have to bleep it, but... Okay, so but I'm just going to say sneaky effort. Yeah, okay, okay. yeah. <laughs> so a sneaky effort mm -hmm. is a zoological term that was introduced in the 70s that speaks to the fancy mm -hmm. scientific term is kleptogamy. Kleptogamy is the stealing of mating opportunities, right? So, right? Yep. Klepto, right? Right, right. right? right. And gamy is of the of the gametes, right? So, so the idea is that in many species, you have different types of males. So let's take, for example, two, two phenotypes of males. There is a dominant male who usually secures most of the mating opportunities. And if you are of the phenotype that is not a dominant male, then you're left out of the mating market. You're going to be a, you're going to lose in the mating market. So then what you do is you evolve the sneaky effort strategy, which makes you mimic, this is called female mimicry, sexual mimicry, where you pretend that you are female so that as the male is guarding and you come in, he goes, oh yeah, okay, nice female, get in there. And then as you get in, now you engage in surreptitious mating and hence sneaky effort. Mm -hmm. And so, and and that, by, that behavior has been documented in uh, various taxa of animals. And so I take this principle and I argue, aha, and I, one of the first places where I uh, announced this theory, although many places I have before writing the press of mine, one of the famous places that people first heard me say it was in a chat with uh, Jordan Peterson mm -hmm. uh, when he had first come on my show. And I remember I had told him that theory and he just, you know, he was amazed by it. Right, right. Uh, so anyways, so male social justice warriors don't look like Navy SEALs, right? Right. They don't have that morphology. They don't have, uh, you know, that. They're not going to uh, be cast as He-Man if they do another of those movies. Exactly. Right. So what they are doing is they are signaling how empathetic, how nurturing, how loving they are so that, so that then the women around them can lower their guard. And then maybe I can sneak in a surreptitious mating opportunity. And I link it, by the way, so so I use, so in, in my theory, it's male social justice warriors as sneaky efforts, but then I link it to other contexts in popular culture. So for example, I talk about in the book, the uh, movies, the teenage movies in the 1980s, uh, and the classic example would be, there's a, uh, you know, kind of a coming of age movie in, I think it was 1985, Pretty in Pink, mm -hmm. where, the the girl the the the, male, the female protagonist has a best friend called uh, named Ducky who's always around her and he's her right and he's right 
Well, what he's doing basically is he's hoping that one day by me being the nurturing friend to you, that I might get a shot at you. So in a sense, he's engaging in sneaky effort attempt, mm -hmm. but not in the male social justice warrior sense. And so that's where I got the idea from, by looking at other animals and then linking to the Antifa boys. Okay, great. So yeah, <laughs> definitely when you said that, that was a, uh, I've been saying that phrase every time I've been thinking about having you on the show. Um, <laughs> okay, can I ask you, uh, so you, you mentioned a bit about... Um, I I heard you talk about this recently when you were on Rogan's show, but I think you mentioned in the book as well about how some academics are very hyper specialized, but that's yes. not what you do. So can you speak to just for the listener who doesn't know about that, and then talk about the relevance to the situation we're in? Sure. So you know there are like most things in life when you're trying to achieve a goal, there are different strategies. You can do strategy A or strategy B, B, and then most people will tell you sort of the orthodoxy, well, if you wanna succeed in this line of work, you need to follow strategy A. So now let's link that general thing mm -hmm. to academia. In academia, there's a great premium that's placed on hyper specialization. So go very, 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 very deep on an incredibly small subset of a subset of a subset issue and become the king or queen of that issue. And for the next 40 years, keep publishing plus epsilon of that. So plus epsilon, plus epsilon, so that after 40 years, you are the king or queen of this ultra, right? And now the reason why people suggest that that's the, the way to go about it, let me just plug my, my computer, sorry, is, is because they think that, look, there are economies of scale that come with you doing that. I don't have to keep reading new literature when I'm doing literature review because I've already done all that. I've already mastered the methodology within that paradigm, right? So there are there are economies of scale that come with me being hyper specialized. Mm -hmm. Another strategy, which almost no academic follows, except you're looking at the king of those academics, is you are a polymath. You are mm -hmm. a true interdisciplinarian in the most classic way possible. You go to intellectual landscapes as a function of whether they tickle your fancy or not. That's not the way to become a successful academic because what academics want to do is see that you belong just like any other human being, they succumb to tribalism. Mm -hmm. So if you are a consumer psychologist, you should publish in these consumer psychology journals if you publish in nature or science, who gives a mm -hmm. shit? That's not, that's not consumer psychology, mm -hmm. right? So in my case, being the irreverent guy that I am, right? I published in medicine. I published in economics. I published in psychology. I published in evolutionary theory mm -hmm. and bibliometrics. I've published about political science issues. Literally, I'm all over the place. So I've had people who were looking at my CV because they want to offer me some prestigious professorship somewhere that will always come back to me and say, yeah, what are the problems we're having with your CV, Dr. Saad, is, you know, you're scattered. Mm -hmm. You're all over the place. Well, no, I'm called an intellectual. And so I try to solve problems irrespective of where the discipline they reside in, right? Mm -hmm. No. I could tomorrow solve cancer and my consumer psychologist friends would say, mm, too bad about your solving cancer right. because ultimately it's not in consumer psychology. Right. And I guess the, the, the reason, one of the reasons, like just institutionally to explain like, why does this happen? Because I think when the average person hears that, they're, they're shocked. Like, why would that? But it's because like the different departments, they care about their rankings, you know, so for prospective grad students. And so we don't want get out there wasting time publishing on cancer research because we know we got to get the, the the ranking of our department up. And so we look at the exactly. journals you publish. Okay. Exactly. As a matter of fact, you know, I'm so glad you gave that exact reward mechanism. Mm -hmm. So let's say, so I'm housed in a business school. Mm -hmm. So every year there's a ranking of the top business schools in the world that comes out. And uh, let's say there'll be, here are the four, when, when they are ranking the prestige of the faculty in terms of where they publish, here are the 40 journals that are within what we use for the rankings. Mm -hmm. If you're not in those 40, forget it. So let's say on the origin of species by Charles Darwin. So Charles Darwin goes up to get tenure or whatever, and he gives the book 
that explains the speciation of every biological creature. Mm, sorry, not in economics, not going to help you. Right. Mr. Darwin, get lost. You're a moron, right? right. But same thing for Newton. Sorry, you didn't publish uh, Principia Mathematica in our favorite journals in Journal of Econometrics, right? So there is a, 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 a an inauthenticity to the way that we... Now, I understand any metric of evaluation is going to have holes. But what upsets me is the hypocrisy of every single university in its mission statement stating that we are for breaking silos. We are for interdisciplinarity. And then the second you have someone that is a walking manifestation of interdisciplinarity, boo, boo, why are right. you so scatterbrained? Right, right, right. Um, can I ask you one more question? Go for it. All right. So in the in your book, um, you mentioned early on that you, you, you were in Lebanon and there was a civil war and ultimately your, your family had to flee. So I'm wondering, and I know you were younger, obviously, but do you see any, so again, folks, we're, we're recording this conversation the day before the U.S. election, but by the time this interview comes out, you know, the cities might be on fire. So I'm, I'm asking, like, in all seriousness, like, do you see, we're talking here about, oh, the Civil War and stuff. Do you see, think that's a real thing? Like, or, you know what I mean? Because you right. saw it actually happen. So I'm just wondering yes. what's your take on that. So it's been many decades that I've been warning anybody who wants to listen that the 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 dreadful ideas that I discuss in the parasitic mind that are slowly eroding the protective belt of foundational values that makes the West the great place that it is, is gonna down the road lead to violence and war. Now, people always think, but give me a date. Is it by next Tuesday? No, it could be 50 years, it could be 20 years, it could be 100 years, but you can't have, for example, let's take one example. You can't have a political party that is deeply all in on identity politics, and that's not going to lead to violence in the future. I come from Lebanon that is the ultimate epitome of what happens to a society that is singularly defined by identity politics. In the case of Lebanon, it's your religious affiliation that's the identity politic mm -hmm. metric, right? So as a matter of fact, in the Lebanese constitution, whether you're going to be president or prime minister or whatever, is based on which religion you are. Imagine how strange that sounds, right? Mm -hmm. Well, the progressives in the in the United States are certainly doubling down on identity politics in, in all of these different manifestations. So people are not going to be quiet forevermore. People are not going to accept in taking critical race theory as part of their manual training at their where they're told you know you're a piece of garbage you should suffer from intergenerational stuff that was done that had nothing to do with you people will revolt you're creating all of the right recipe for strife to occur so i can't say it will happen a week after biden or trump wins but if we continue this trajectory and take a much longer view of history we will erode all of the things that make the West what it is, and we will have violence. Okay, all right, thank you. Um, so I think that's probably a good spot to, to wrap up. Folks, um, go to bobmurphyshow.com slash 167 to get all the links for this. My guest has been Dr. Gad Sad. His book is The Parasitic Mind, How Infectious Ideas Are Killing Common Sense. And he's got, you got plenty of blurbs from Jordan Peterson and others um, just to, to show that this is a, a book well worth people uh, checking out. Uh, thanks so much for your time. Thank you so much, sir. Thanks. Cheers. You've just experienced another episode of The Bob Murphy Show, the podcast promoting free markets, free minds, and grateful souls. For more information and to subscribe to this podcast, visit BobMurphyShow.com.